Hi, folks. Can you all hear me okay? If you don't understand my accent, please let me know. Okay. I say funny words like Texas and things like that. And it was pretty hard down south. Okay, look, thanks very much for coming tonight. Um, I enjoy being in Colorado. It's a great state. And I've had good walks around the mountains and seen the mule deer and antelope and all sorts of things, and I love that kind of stuff. But what I really love is being here and what is the cradle of liberty, you know, what the country that has defended liberty and promoted liberty more than any other in Western, in, in human, in, in history. And a lot of people ask me, you know, why as a New Zealander I should care about the internal politics of this country? And there's two reasons for that. Um, well, it's more than two, but the two key reasons are one, one is simple gratitude and that my country is only free because of the sacrifice, the huge sacrifice that American servicemen made in the battles of Guadalcanal <coughs> and the Coral Sea and Midway during World War II. If it hadn't been for that sacrifice, my country would have been subjugated by the Japanese and we would have had a very different history. So uh, me and a lot of New Zealanders are very grateful for that and there's a bond that goes right back to those times. The second reason is related but a little more selfish in that you know, Ronald Reagan had it right. This country is the last best hope for mankind. If freedom falls in America, it will fall everywhere. There's no place to run. If freedom falls here, if you lose your ability to defend your country, your economy goes down, your defenses go down, the Russians, the Chinese, Iranians, Cubans, Venezuelans, Nicaraguans, North Koreans, and all their allies will carve up this globe amongst themselves. A lot of people email me and say, if Obama gets back in, can I come and live in New Zealand? I understand that's a beautiful country, but a thousand miles to the north of New Zealand lies Fiji, and the Chinese are na now training the Fijian army and are building big hydroelectric plants in that country. Fiji is now effectively a Chinese client state. The Chinese have moved all through the South Pacific, and I could tell you the day the American, the US Navy stops patrolling that area is the day that my country becomes a Chinese vassal state. So I don't want that to happen for myself and my kids, and I want Americans to be able to come down here for, good, for big holidays, spend lots of money, and enjoy the Kiwi experience. But I'd rather at this stage you stay here and fight, because this is now the front line of freedom. This is really is the front line of the battle. So I'd like to discuss today, I'll start with what, I'm cons what I call the central secret of communism. And this is going to lead into some subjects. The central secret of communism is not atom bomb spies or labor union activists or bomb throwers in the streets. It is the ability of a tiny Marxist-Leninist party to get their policies enacted as the law of the land in their host country. That means, you know, in the French Communist Party, getting their, their policies pushed through the French Parliament. Or the Canadian Communist Party getting their policies pushed through the Canadian Parliament. Or in America, communist policies being promoted through the House, of your, through your House, through your Senate, and being signed off by the President. Now, that might sound a little bit far-fetched, because these are only t tiny sects we're talking about, a few thousand members. But I'd like to give you some examples, and I'll start with one from my country, New Zealand. In 1984, New Zealand elected a socialist Labour government, and the very first thing they promoted, they pushed a law through banning nuclear warships from our harbours. Now that led to the destruction of a long-standing military alliance with the United States, the Australia-New Zealand-US military alliance, ANZUS, was destroyed just like that. 
That was sold to us not as, a, as a patriotic measure. New Zealanders were standing up proud. We were, we were striking up for peace. We were opposing the nuclear arms race, and we were going to stand up to those Yanks who wanted to get their dirty nukes in our harbours. And it is so entrenched in, America, in New Zealand today, Kiwis are so proud of it, that even our conservative governments don't even dare to think about overturning it. It is so much part of our culture. So how did that come about? How did we thumb our nose at the people who had saved our bacon only 40 years before? It happened this way. In the late 80s, I interviewed a man extensively who had infiltrated the New Zealand Communist Party for the secu uh, our security intelligence services. In 1983, he was chosen to go to Moscow to study at Lenin's Institute for Higher Learning in Leningradsky Prospect, Moscow. At that institute, there were 7,000 students, on some of them on seven-year courses, some of them with one-to-one -one tutelage. It was a training ground for re revolutionaries all over the world. There were Nigerians, there were Libyans, there were Nicaraguans, Sri Lankans, Filipinos, Canadians, Australians, Danes, Cypriots, Egyptians. Virtually every country of the globe was represented except for one. And that was the United States of America. Now why was the main enemy exempt? Why was the main enemy not training at that school? Because at some point, your government had told the Soviets that, were, that had any Americans been caught training at Lenin's Institute, there would be war. And the Soviets respected that. But they used to train Canadians or Mexicans or New Zealanders in the doctrines they wanted promoted, then those people would go and train the American communists. So they got round it in the usual devious so Soviet manner. So my friend sat in Moscow with the KGB, with his small group of communists, with the tutors of the institute. And they worked out that was the time of the big anti-nuclear marches in Europe, the time when Reagan was fighting for Star Wars and opposing communism in Latin America. So the Soviets wanted to break away a country from the Western Alliance in the hope that that would create a chain reaction leading to the destruction of NATO. That's what they wanted to achieve. And they picked on us because we were small, we were liberal, and we already had a very strong communist presence in our country that had a lot of influence in our Labour Party. It controlled the Labour unions and it also controlled the New Zealand peace movement. So we were an ideal target. So they worked out how they would sell this psychologically. They worked out how they would sell it as a patriotic measure. They worked all the language, the slogans they would need. They worked it all out, and those communists went back to New Zealand. They communicated with the, the, the secret communists in the Labour Party. They told the Labour unions what to say. They told the peace movement what to say. In a few short months, they passed that legislation. The Soviets were blown away how quickly it was done. They passed that legislation and destroyed a military alliance at a most critical time at the height of the Cold War. And I will tell you, not one New Zealander in 100,000 today would have any idea where that policy came from. They'll all put their hand on their heart and say, this was our idea, it was a Kiwi thing, we were standing up to the Americans and we thought of it. You know, and you challenge them. Next time you meet a New Zealander, you ask them. But I can tell you exactly where that policy came from. Now we'll look for a more local example. We'll go to a state not far from here, California. Every year, the Californians have a Cesar Chavez holiday. Okay, they all get out and have a day off to mark the great Cesar Chavez, the founder of the United Farm Workers, trained by Saul Alinsky himself, worked with communists and socialists his entire life, and he had the famous slogan, Cese Puede, Yes, We Can. Familiar? It should be. There's a direct link between the two movements. 
The César Chavez holiday was organised by Evelina Alacon of the César Chavez holiday campaign. Evelina Alacon was basically enlisted a whole lot of left-wing Labour supporters, left-wing movie stars, and they got le that legislature put through the California State Legislature. Evelina Alacon is the leader of the Southern California Communist Party USA. She is now trying to take the holiday nationwide, and her website proudly proclaims the endorsement of one Barack Obama. In 2008, Evelina Alacon even went to a gathering in Los Angeles in a restaurant where she gave a great big Cesar Chavez poster to Maya Sotoro Ning, the sister of Barack Obama, and used that as a big photo op, a big promotional for her campaign. So we'll look at a, a bigger example now, one that I think everybody here will be familiar with, one that is affecting everybody in this room right now, and that is Obamacare. Now Obamacare is not yet socialised single payer medicine, but we all know where it's heading. It's going to nationalise, if it is not repealed, it's going to nationalise, socialise between one-sixth and one-quarter of the US economy. And that is going to have huge implications for your country. Not just for your health care, but, but for the whole outlook of society. It will move your country left. So the, the, the father of single-payer or socialised health care in this country is one Quentin Young. He's nearly 90 now. He's a doctor out of Chicago, but he's been agitating since the 1950s for single-payer health care. He set up all sorts of alliances, all sorts of groups, all sorts of seminars and whatever. He's campaigned for 50 years on this. He's worked with John Conyers and other members of Congress to get single-payer legislation put on the floor of your Congress time and time again. But it was only in 2008 when Barack Obama was elected that they really started to make headway. Quentin Young was Barack Obama's personal physician in Chicago. He openly claims that he indoctrinated Obama into the ideas of single-payer health care. Openly boasts of that. Quentin Young was a 40-year veteran of the Communist Party USA before he left that organisation to set up another Marxist group, Democratic Socialists of America. So please never tell me that one man cannot change the world. Because if Quentin Young has his way, your country will be socialist forever and the rest of the world will follow. Now, a lot of people say that Barack Obama made a great movement. But I will say to you that a movement made Barack Obama. And that movement started, really got underway in Hyde Park, Chicago in the 1950s. And that is when, that is when a small group of the, the Communist Party and the Socialist Party USA got together, they normally fought, but they got together and decided to form an alliance to take on the daily machine, the corrupt daily machine that ran Chicago for decades. And they got together and they formed alliances with the black population of South Chicago, with the Latino populations and the labor unions. Does any of that, any of that sound familiar at all? That's where it started. So they got underway and the first thing they did, they got a guy called Leon Dupre elected to the Chicago City Council. Now, Leon Dupre in the 1920s used to go to rifle ranges with his friend Saul Alinsky where they practiced target shooting for the revolution they were sure was soon to break out, the Communist Revolution. In, 19, in about 1940, Leon Dupre went down to Mexico where he met with Leon Trotsky, the exiled communist leader who was shortly after, thereafter executed, assassinated by Stalin. So that was Leon Dupre's pedigree. 
The next guy they got elected was Harold Washington as mayor of Chicago in 1983. Very popular guy, a, a long-time communist and socialist, democratic socialist of America supporter, a fellow traveler. So they got him elected. Then in 1992, they got Carol Mosley Brown elected to the US Senate. After, after her very inauspicious term, she was uh, sent by Clinton to become ambassador to New Zealand. So thank you very much, Bill. It was a great treat. In 1996, they got Barack Obama elected to the Illinois State Senate. In 2004, they got him elected to the US Senate. And in 2008, by using their alliances all over the country, the communist and socialist alliances, they got Barack Obama into the White House. And that, he who pays, pays the piper calls the tune, and Barack Obama owed them big time, and he's been delivering ever since. His agenda is their agenda. His agenda is a communist and socialist agenda. There's no other way of putting it. So, this is not an unusual phenomenon. You know, that the left has always done this. They've picked out promising young activists, usually black or Latino, and by using the labor unions, the black churches, or whoever they had influence with, they would get these people elected into state legislatures, to Congress, the Senate, or whatever, and get them to promote socialist legislation disguised as Democrat legislation into the floors of your, you know, and, into your state legislatures, your Congress, etc. And I will say to you that if, you know, good examples of this would be Antonio Villagarosa, the current mayor of Los Angeles, Andrew Young, who was once the mayor of Atlanta and also the UN, US ambassador to the United Nations. Got um, several of them are sitting right now in the Missouri State Legislature, the Florida Legislature, the Michigan Leg Legislature, the Massachusetts Legislature, already waiting to get into Congress and lead this country down their road. So I will say to you, if you want to know, if you want to know what the Democrats are going to do tomorrow, read the Communist Party USA's People's World Today or Democratic Socialists of America's Democratic Left, because they are setting the policy, they control the labor unions, the Democrats are dependent on the labor unions to get elected, so they will enact communist or socialist policy as directed. That is how it works. So these small, far-left groups, allied to Cuba and Russia and China, can tell the Democrats what legislation they want promoted. And the Democrats, like good little puppy dogs, will do exactly what they're told. They used to call it treason once. Now they just call it democracy. So we'll get on to Barack Obama. What made Obama the man he is today? <clears throat> the first mentor of Barack Obama was a guy called Frank Marshall Davis a black poet, writer, and journalist out of Chicago, prominent Communist Party member, very well up on the Chicago left, very respected in the Chicago art scene of the day, which is very, very vibrant. But in 1948, he left all that, be left all that behind and went out to a little backwater in the Pacific called Hawaii. Now, why would he do that? At the time... The Soviets had directed the US Communist Party to move as many comrades off the mainland as they could out to Hawaii because A, that's where Pearl Harbor was and they wanted as many spies on the island as they could get and they also wanted as many agitators as they could get to hopefully get that base closed down. The Communists were also anticipating Hawaiian statehood because they knew if they could take over the local Democrat Party, which they did, they could guarantee two more left-wing senators in your Senate every election cycle and a whole bunch more of left-wing Democrat congressmen because that was just giving them leverage. It would move the, your country to the left and make it harder for Republicans to ever gain a majority. 
That is the reason why the hard left is promoting the, has pr pr promoted the DC statehood movement for many years, and it's a reason why they're promoting the Puerto Rican statehood movement today. It's all about the numbers. They don't care about Puerto Rico, they just want more leftists in your Senate, in your Congress, to marginalise conservatives and republicans and push their agenda even further to the left. So Frank Marshall Davis moves out to Hawaii. He works for the Honolulu Record, which is a labour union publication there. It's um, run by a guy called Koji Ariyoshi, a Communist Party member. Ariyoshi had been working with the US Army in China in World War II with Mao Zedong's communist forces against the Japanese. After World War II, Ariyoshi went to New York where he worked with the Amerasia people. They, Amerasia was a magazine staffed by communist and Soviet spies who worked with your State Department to tilt US foreign policy away from the Chinese nationalists of Chiang Kai-shek towards the communists of Mao Zedong. And because they succeeded, 500 million Chinese were delivered to the communists with huge implications for the world ever since. So Ariyoshi did that. Frank Marshall Davis was busy inf infiltrating the local Democrat party. He also had an interesting hobby, and the FBI, who was watching him like a hawk, used to see him going out to obscure beaches and geographical locations, photographing all these strange places all over Hawaii. Now, there's an obvious implication why he may have been doing that. And the FBI was so concerned about Frank Marshall Davis, they put him on the security index. And that meant that had war ever broken out with the Soviet Union, Davis would have been arrested that day. Now, not all, not all communists were on that index, only the hardcore, dangerous, influential communists. That, that's what the FBI thought of Frank Marshall Davis. About 1970, Davis met the young Barack Obama and mentored him for approximately nine years until Barack Obama left for Occidental College around 1979. A lot of people say that Frank Marshall Davis by that time was just a dope-smoking old alcoholic. You know, he was no threat to Obama. He was, his communist days were way behind him. As late as 1979, Frank Marshall Davis was still listed as an endorser of the, Ameri of the American Committee for the Protection of Foreign Born, the leading Communist Party front of the time. Another guy who endorsed that organisation was Hugh de Lacey, who we will talk about later. So basically there's no evidence that Frank Marshall Davis ever ceased being a red. And he had your president's ear for nine years in his most formative years. So Obama leaves, leaves Hawaii, goes to Occidental. There he mixed with Tom Hayden's radical crowd and with the Democratic Socialists of America people. He then went out to Columbia University in New York. There he attended at least one and possibly two of the annual Socialist Scholars Conferences that were then held in Cooper Union usually. They weren't just socialists, they were... 2,000 to 3,000 hardcore radical Marxists, gay activists, radical feminists, black Marxists, the whole works, all sitting in a big hall, pro plotting how to bring your country to its knees. And Barack Obama was in the midst of that. So then Obama goes out to Chicago. And the reason he says he went to Chicago was because he was inspired by the election of the left-wing mayor, Mayor Harold Washington. He even applied for a job in Washington's administration, which was, st was stacked with communists and socialists. He didn't get that job, but he still went to Chicago, where he became a community organiser, worked with ACORN and other radical groups. But in the mid-90s, he set his course on politics. And... The woman who got Barack Obama his start in Illinois, in Illinois politics was one Alice Palmer. 
She was an Illinois state senator. She wanted to run for Congress, so she gave Barack Obama her, Illinois, her state senate seat, basically handed it to him. So she took him all around, introducing him to fundraisers, labor union people, community activists, all the people he had to know. She was a woman who took Barack Obama to the famous meeting in the drawing room of Bill Ears and Bernadine Dawn, the former weather underground terrorist leaders. Quentin Young was at the same meeting where Barack Obama was basically introduced to the Hyde Park left. And that was what got him started. So Alice Palmer had a very interesting history. In 1980, she was personally invited, and I have the invitation cards, copies of them, to Granada to celebrate the first anniversary of the Marxist revolution in that country by the communist dictators of that country, Morris Bishop. It was Morris Bishop's government. He was actually killed by an even worse faction that was expelled by Ronald Reagan in 1983 when he sent troops to invade that country. And I'll tell you, my friend was in Moscow when that happened, and the Soviets were spitting that Reagan had dared to kick one of their clients to, to kick their comrade out of that country. So Alice Palmer did that. In 1983, she went to Czechoslovakia, to Prague, for a meeting of the Soviet Front World Peace Council. In 1985, she took 16 black American journalists, almost all communists, to the Soviet Union, to, to East Germany and Czechoslovakia, where they met with officials of the Czech Foreign Affairs Department to discuss issues in this country. She was also a leader of, at the time of the Black Press Institute, which was a nationwide network of communist black journalists whose job was to agitate and sow propaganda amongst this country's black population. She was also an, on the executive of the US Peace Council, which was a Communist Party USA front, where she served with people like Barbara Lee, who is now a Democrat congresswoman out of California. You've probably seen Crazy Barbara on TV many times. In 1986, Alice Palmer was the only American journalist to cover that year's convention, annual conference of the Communist Party of the Soviet Union in Moscow. The same year, she was elected as president of the International Organization of Journalists. That was a Soviet front basically aimed at influencing journalists all over the world. Alice Palmer's job was to look after the United States, Canada, Latin America, Mexico, and the Caribbean. She was also there to implement what they called their new information order, very sinister sounding phrase. And that had all to do with what they called issues of media fairness. Now, who's ever, who remembers the fairness doctrine? Okay, a few of you, a lot of you. The fairness doctrine was abolished by Ronald Reagan in the 80s. It was the idea, and I'll ask you to consider where that fairness doctrine may have come from. It was the idea that if you had a, a radio station, for example and you gave a two-hour slot to a conservative talkback host, you had to give equal time to a liberal. It was social justice on the airways. The left did not, did not consider it fair that conservative, conservatives could attract audiences and sponsorship and get paid high salaries where the poor, dumb liberal hacks got no audience, no sponsorship, and no money. That was not just... So the fairness doctrine was there to address that balance. And it was only because Reagan abolished that in the 80s, conservative talkback became economic, and you had the Rush Limbaugh's and the Sean Hannity's and the beginnings of the movement you people had today. That would not have happened had Ronald Reagan not abolished that doctrine, a Soviet-inspired doctrine, in my opinion. And it's no surprise that Barack Obama wants to introduce, reintroduce some version of it today and extend it to the internet because he wants to shut you people down. That is what it's for. So please do not let it happen. So Alice Palmer, to put it bluntly, was a high-level Soviet, Soviet operative. There's no other way of putting it. 
right in there with the KGB and the Soviet government. And she is the woman who got your president his first job in politics. So we'll go to the present day. You're judged by the company you keep, and I'm very proud to be judged by you people, I must say. But I'll look at two people around Barack Obama, his key advisors. The first is Valerie Jarrett, the other half of Obama's brain. That's what they call her. Valerie Jarrett, but the liberal journalists call her that. Valerie Jarrett is Obama's key, most trusted advisor. She, there's nothing he does not share with Valerie. Valerie Jarrett introduced Obama to his wife. She fundraised for him, introduced him to the Chicago people he had to know. She has helped his career, and she sits in the White House now as basically an unofficial cabinet member. Valerie Jarrett has an interesting family pedigree. Her mother was Barbara Bowman out of Chicago, is Barbara Bowman out of Chicago, a child psychologist. She runs the Erickson Institute. That organisation has, has a lot of influence on early childhood education in your country. In 2009, President Obama gave Barbara Bowman an award for her work. And that award, that ceremony was prominently featured in the pages of the Communist Party USA's People's World. Now the Erickson Institute is named after Eric Erickson. Now he was an, an errant disciple of Sigmund Freud. He's the man who coined the term identity crisis. Some of you may have heard that. Eric Erickson was kicked out of Berkeley University in the 1940s because he refused to sign an anti-communist loyalty oath. He was also a lecturer at the time at the California Labor School, the Communist Party's trade union education apparatus. On the board of the Erickson Institute have served Tom Ears, the father of weather underground terrorist leader Bill Ears, and Bernadine Dawn, the wife of Bill Ears and a famous terrorist leader in her own right. On the other half, on the other side of the Jarrett family was Vernon Jarrett, v Valerie Jarrett's late father-in-law. Vernon Jarrett was a very prominent black Chicago journalist, very well thought of, very respected. The last thing he did when he was dying of cancer in 2004 was to issue a call through his columns for the black population of Chicago to get out and vote for Barack Obama in that year's Senate primaries. And they did. He'd followed Obama's career for some time and shown a very strong interest in the young state senator. In 1946, Vernon Jarrett served on the Illinois State Executive of American Youth for Democracy, a very noble-sounding organisation, one I'm sure we would all support, except that it wasn't the youth wing of the Democrat Party, it was the youth wing of Communist Party USA. In 1948, Vernon Jarrett served on the Publicity Committee of the Packing House Workers Strike Committee. The Packing House Workers were a communist-controlled trade union and on strike, and Vernon Jarrett was running their publicity. On that publicity committee with Vernon Jarrett served Frank Marshall Davis. So isn't it interesting that those two people in the White House who are effectively running your country today can trace their political origins, their political background, back to the Communist Party USA of Chicago in the 1940s. Coincidence, no doubt. I wonder what the media would say if John McCain had been elected and he had an advisor in the White House and both of their they could trace their lineage back to, a, to the Ku Klux Klan of, you know, Alabama of the 1940s. Imagine what the media would do with that. We'll go to the other half of Barack Obama's brain, which doesn't leave very much. Okay, and that's David Axelrod. 
Okay, now David Axelrod got Obama elected. He beat, he beat Hillary Clinton's machine. Can you imagine that? The ruthless Clinton machine, and David Axelrod beat it with an untried, untested senator with a funny Islamic name. And David Axelrod beat Hillary Clinton. So David Axelrod, he got some training, and I'll go into that in a minute. David Axelrod, his mother was, was a woman called Meryl Bennett. She was an advertising executive out of New York. She came up with the famous focus group concept, you know, where you go to a room and you check out a new toothpaste or a political slogan, and, and they give you a, some gas vouchers or some movie tickets to, for your time. Well, Meryl Bennett came up with that, but in the 1940s, she used to work for a magazine out of New York called PM, a so-called liberal magazine, but like a lot of liberal things, half of the members of its staff were Communist Party members, including at least one Soviet spy, the famous journalist I.F. or Izzy Stone. Now, when David Axelrod moved to Chicago in the 1970s to study political science. He was picked up, mentored, and trained, guided in his early career by two prominent Chicago journalists, Don Rose and David S. Cantor. These guys got Axelrod his first job in journalism, and they taught him his political tricks. Don Rose and David S. Cantor had just before that run for several years a magazine in Hyde Park, Chicago, called the Hyde Park Kenwood Voices. It was effectively the voice of the Hyde Park left. It used to carry articles about Quentin Young and his trip to North Vietnam during the, North Viet during the Vietnamese War, about his son's, son Ethan's trip to cut sugar cane for Castro in Cuba, it carried articles praising the SDS rioters in Chicago in 1968. It had a regular column by the local congressman Abner Mikva, promoted his career. Abner Mikva was a congressman out, out of Chicago for many years, a very, very militant opponent of gun rights. That's what he was known for. After he left Congress, Abner Mikva became an open supporter of Democratic Socialists of America. He was also for many years a mentor to one Barack Obama and another person that you all know. He mentored this woman for many years. Her name is Yelena Kagan, now serves on your Supreme Court. So as I say, this is a very incestuous bunch we're talking about. Don Rose, one half of this partnership, was a communist fronter for many years, right back to the 1940s. His Chicago Red Squad file, the police file on him, described him as a dangerous anarchist. He was an official, an official leader of the, of the Chicago Committee to Defend the Bill of Rights, where he served with Quentin Young. That was the leading Communist Party USA front of the era and still exists. The other half of the partnership was David Cantor. His father, Harry Cantor, used to run the Massachusetts Communist Party in the 1930s. He was jailed for a year for sedition over the Sacco Vanzetti case when two Italian anarchists were executed for murder. After he got out of jail, he took the whole family, including young baby David, to the Soviet Union, to Stalin's paradise, where they lived for many years. But by 1948, David, Axel, uh, David Cantor was living in Chicago, running, editing the student newspaper at the university, was an active member of the Communist Party. Fast forward to 1960, David Cantor and another communist called Leroy Wolins were running a little organisation out of Chicago called, Tran called Trans World Publications. Trans World Publications was charged with distributing Soviet literature all over the United States. It was subsidised by the Soviet Embassy in Washington, D.C., 
and Wolands and Cantor were required at one point to register as agents of a foreign power. Fast forward to 1964. Who remembers the famous race that year between, between Lyndon Johnson and Barry Goldwater? Okay, shows your age, some people. But um, Barry Goldwater, Lyndon Johnson won that race, and he gave us the Great Society, the biggest advance in socialism since the, night, since the New Deal, and he gave us the riots of the 60s and the chaos that ensued. Changed the face of this country. Barry Goldwater was a conservative, a patriot, a hardcore conservative. Had he won that election, this country would have been a whole different place, and I venture to say a much stronger place today, a much better country. One of the main reasons that Barry Goldwater lost that race because he was vilified, viciously vilified, as a racist, a fascist, and an extremist. Any of those terms familiar to any people here? More things change, eh? One of the main sources of the vilification of Barry Goldwater was Trans World Publications out of Chicago. So I'm telling you that the man who is sitting in Chicago right now trying to re-elect your president was trained and given his guidance, taught all his tricks by a professional Soviet-paid black propagandist. So you may wonder where David Axelrod gets his hardcore tactics from. That brings me to what I consider is the real agenda of the left in this country. And don't we all want to know that? You know, what, what do they want? Why do they get up every day, go to their labor union offices or their non-profit or to their democratic office or whatever and plot to, to change this country. Why do they do it? What do they hope to achieve? And this is what I consider, I'm going to tell you what I consider is the real agenda of the left. But before I do that, I want to build up a little bit of credibility for an Albuquerque high school math teacher named Mark Rudd. Now why would I want to do that? Some of you know the name. Mark Rudd was the brains, one of the key leaders of the Weather Underground Terrorist Organization. In 1968, he was the leader of the, of the Columbia University SDS riots of that time. In 1969, he was in Cuba training under a KGB major. In 2006, Mark Rudd and Bill Ayers and Bernadine Dawn and Tom Hayden and Angela Davis all names you'll probably recognise, and Jeff Jones, another weather underground terrorist leader who incidentally wrote part of Obama's stimulus package. They all got together with a bunch of former SDSs, SDS people, Communist Party members, Democratic Socialists of America members. They all got together to form a new organisation called Movement for a Democratic Society. And don't they love that word, eh? And that was, the, that was an adult support group for the new SDS, which is now active on campuses all over America. The new SDS were the, were the people who created Mary Hell at the, at the 2008, I think it was, Republican Convention in Minneapolis. So these guys got together to create this. In 2008, Tom Hayden and other MDS leaders set up a subsidiary organisation and they called it Progressives for Obama. It was designed to, re to unite the left-wing support behind the candidate, their candidate. Mark Rudd endorsed that organisation. So what I'm trying to say here is that Mark Rudd knows the left, he's a brains man of the left, he goes way back and he personally knows people who know Obama. So when he predicts Obama's agenda, and says where it's going to go to, I give him some credibility. Now in 2008, November, just after the election, Barack Obama appointed some conservatives to defence positions. And some people on our side of the fence went, 
You know, wow, that's cool. You know, maybe he's not such a left wing radical after all. Maybe he's going to be a centrist president. Maybe we don't have to worry about all these radical stories. But the left were spewing. They were so upset because they'd got this guy elected. And what was he doing appointing conservatives to the hated military industrial complex? And they were letting Mark Rudd and people like that know all about it. And Mark Rudd had to calm the comrades down. He had to get them back on board, get them back on board with the agenda. So he wrote an article for the RAG blog out of Texas in 2008, November 28th, just after the election. The RAG blog was run by former SDSs, Weather Underground people, many of whom have close ties with Cuba, incidentally. And he called the article, Let's Get Smart About Obama. And this is what he said. Obama is a very strategic thinker. He knew precisely what it would take to get elected, and he didn't blow it. He knew he had to play to the centre to not be run over by the press, the Republicans, or to scare centrist voters away. He made it. So he has a narrow mandate for change. The, the economic agenda will stress stimulation from the bottom at some times and handouts to the top at others. Is that familiar at all? How did, Mark, how did Mark Rudd know that? On foreign policy and the wars and the use of the military, there will be no change at all. And never, never threaten the military budget. That will unite a huge major, majority of Congress against him. And will unite a huge majority of Congress against him. And I agree with this strategy. Anything else would invite sure defeat. Leave the military alone for now. Leave the military alone because they are way too powerful for now. By the second or third year of this recession, when stimulus is needed at the bottom, people may begin to discuss cutting the military budget. Now, where are we now, ladies and gentlemen? We're three years in. You're all worried about your jobs, your businesses, paying your mortgages, keeping your kids in college, focusing on the economic issues, and I perfectly understand why, but what is Leon Panetta, your Secretary of Defence, doing over at the Pentagon right now? 6% of US federal spending is taking nearly 100% of the cuts. While you're focused on the economic issues, Leon Panetta is gutting the only thing the federal government is mandated to do. And why do you think he might, who do you think stands to gain from that? Could it be Russia, China, Venezuela, Nicaragua, Cuba, North Korea? The people whose allies have been campaigning in this country to do just that for 50 years now. And your president and your secretary of defence are doing it. So Mark Rudd went on to say, Obama plays basketball. I'm not much of an athlete, barely know the game. But one thing I do know is that you have to be able to look like you're doing one thing, but do another. That's why all these conservative appointments are important. The strategy is faint right Move left. Any other strategy invites sure defeat. So what's Mark Rudd saying here? His president scammed his way into the White House by pretending to be a centrist, but his agenda has always been hard left. And he has got your military firmly in his sights. And this is why I say this is not just an American issue here. This doesn't just concern your country. Because if you, you can survive a depression, if you lose some of your rights, you can fight and take them back. But you cannot survive lowering your defences so far to the point where you can not only not defend your allies like Israel or New Zealand or Australia, you will not be able to defend your own homeland against the combined 
weight of Russia, China and all their allies. Obama is talking about downgrading the military to fighting wars on one front. Russia, China, Iran, Venezuela, Nicaragua, Cuba, that's at least three fronts. It's at least three. Obama is even talking about cutting US nuclear armaments by 80%. Do you think he would have dared campaign on that? 80% at a time where communist and Islamic revolution is sweeping North Africa. East Southern Europe is becoming increasingly, increasingly unstable. Europe is on the verge of economic collapse. Your country is facing huge economic problems. And Russia, China, and Iran have joined together in the Shanghai Cooperation Organization, a new Warsaw Pact, and are working with all your enemies in Latin America against you on every single front. And Obama and Panetta think this is the time to cut your defences. So that brings me to Mr. Leon Panetta himself. Lovely man, very amiable, well thought of, well liked, voted in 100 to 0 through, through your Senate. The man who got Osama bin Laden. We we'll look at Leon Panetta's background, his history. Leon Panetta was a congressman out of Santa Cruz, Southern California. Now, the, Southern, the Santa Cruz Democrat Party is not like the Iowa Democrat Party or the Kentucky Democrat Party or the Montana Democrat Party. It is the far-left, lunatic fringe, nutcase, Southern California Democrat Party. Now, Leon Panetta had Democratic Socialists of America members on his campaign committees, and he worked with DSAs like Mike Laird on all sorts of projects over many years. He put tributes in the congressional record to Lucy Hasler, a longtime Communist Front activist. He worked in the 1970s, as did the Communist Party USA, to free Leonard Peltier from jail. Leonard Peltier was an American Indian activist and the Dakotas who murdered two FBI agents. And Leon Panetta wanted him out of jail. He also worked all through his time in Congress. He opposed Star Wars. He opposed Reagan's policies in Latin America. He fought for every possible reduction in US defense spending he could. That's what he did. That's his record. But, Hugh, but the DeLacy, so, uh, the Hugh, Leon and Sylvia Panetta had some friends in Santa Cruz, and one of them, there was a couple, Hugh DeLacy, remember that name, for the American Committee for the Protection of Foreign Born, with Frank Marshall Davis, and Dorothy Baskin, a former Communist Party member, out of Colorado here. The FBI, FBI arrested her in Colorado in the 1940s. The De Lacy's we had a very close relationship with the Panettas. They used to go to parties at each other's houses, and for over nine years, Hugh De Lacy and, Hugh, and Leon Panetta shared a whole series of letters, correspondence, and I have those letters. And those letters discussed things like how bad Reagan's Star Wars policy was, how terrible he was for opposing the, the Nicaraguan Sandinistas, and that US defence spending had to be cut. And Leon Panetta even gave Mr De Lacy a Brookings Institution defence paper that was not available for public consumption, but Panetta copied that, borrowed it for two weeks, copied it, and gave it to De Lacy. He had to have known that De Lacy was going down to Nicaragua to visit with the Sandinistas, that he had been, and also had been to Spain to visit with the Spanish and Portuguese communist parties. But Hugh de Lacy had an even more, had a very interesting history. From 1946 to 1948, he was a congressman out of Washington State, a Democrat. He spent most of his time on the floor of the US Congress campaigning to shift US support away from Chiang Kai-shek's nationalists towards Mao Tse-tung's communists. That's what he did. 
That's what he was known for. At the time, he was a secret member of the Communist Party USA while serving as a Democrat congressman, not the first, and I can tell you, not the last. He maintained that Communist Party membership at least till the very late 60s. After that, he threw in his lot with the Democratic Socialists of America Marxists, still Marxists. In 1975, he got a little reward for his work in Congress. He was contacted by John Stewart Service, a Stanford University am academic, a former member of the Amerasia Spy Ring, a former friend of De Lacy's from the 40s, and he arranged for him, him and Dorothy to spend a month in communist China as a guest of the communist government. So De Lacy, Hugh and Dorothy De Lacy went to China. They visited the factories and the collective farms. They, you know, watched the little kids wave the red flags, did all that sort of stuff. But they also had time to visit with two American expatriates living there. The first was Frank Coe. Frank Coe was a former member of the Amerasia spy ring, a former member of the Silvermaster KGB spy ring of Washington in the 1940s. He was then working as a propagandist for the Chinese government. The other man was Solomon Adler, also ex Amerasia, also ex Silvermaster spy ring, at the time working as an advisor to the Chinese intelligence services. He was a live Chinese spy while Hugh de Lacy was conferring with him. Back in the United States, Hugh de Lacy was also regularly corresponding with Don Wheeler, a communist out of Washington State, another member of the Silver Master Spiring of the 40s. He was also corresponding with Victor Perlow, another communist out of Connecticut, another former member of the Silver Master Spiring. Incidentally, Victor Perlow's son and daughter-in-law, Joel Fishman, now run the Connecticut Communist Party. Joel Fishman serves on the Communist Party's Political Action Committee, leads it. They are the people delegated to work with the Democratic Party. They run the New, the New Haven People's Centre, the Communist Party's headquarters in that area, and Rosa DeLauro, one of your top Democrat congressmen, has an office in that building and has a very close relationship with, with um, Perlo and Fishman. Hugh DeLacy also served as the, as, a US, as the West Coast agent for In These Times, a socialist journal out of Chicago. That was run by a guy called James Weinstein. Weinstein was a former party member who founded, went on to found Democratic Socialists of America. He also had been peripherally involved in the 1940s with the Rosenberg spy ring, the people who gave Stalin the A-bomb secrets. In 2002, Weinstein and some other militants and Marxists out of Chicago set up a big anti-Iraq war rally in Federal Plaza in Chicago. And that is where Barack Obama first stood up and made his name nationwide as an opponent of the, of the Iraq war. So I repeat my claim. A movement, Barack Obama didn't make a movement. A movement made Barack Obama. And elements of that movement have connections to people who do not owe loyalty to your country. That is why this situation has international implications. But, you know, I don't want you people to get all um, depressed by that. Down at heel. <laughs> Too late. Yep. Because I am here for a reason. <clears throat> I'm here because in 2008, the left thought they had a slam dunk in this country. They had the House, they had the Senate, and they had the White House. And their agenda was ready to roll, and they were going to steam middle America and steamroll middle America into oblivion. And in 2009 and 2010, Glenn Beck and hundreds of thousands of people like you, Tea Party people and patriots, 
rediscovered your constitution, rediscovered what made America great, and you got up and stood up and marched in your hundreds of thousands, and you got into the 2010 elections, and you kicked the left so far up the backside, they're still seeing stars today. You were the biggest shock they ever had. You stopped card check, you stopped cap and trade, you slowed down Obamacare, you watered it down and you took back the house and the left hate you for it. They hate you with a passion and they don't know how to handle you. That's why they've set up the scam Occupy movement, communist controlled Occupy movement. But I'm here <coughs> because you took back the house you started to take your country back. And hundreds of thousands and millions of people all around the world were as shocked by that as the left was. And we are inspired by that and marvel at it and we are rooting for you guys today because we know that if you can keep the faith and take your country back, you'll start a revolution that will travel all around the world. And I talk to a lot of Tea Party people and they say, it's tough, you know. There's not enough of us. There's not enough people listening. Are we having an impact? But I look at you from the outside and I see what a bunch of mainly political novices has done in two or three years. You're now working in state houses all over this country. You're getting into the school boards, the county commissions, and you're altering the political character of this country from the grassroots up all over the country. Your movement is having an impact that will be felt for hundreds of years. You're changing the direction of your, this country. And I say to you, this is 1773 of the Second American Revolution. It's at the beginning, and that was tough. You think about it then, a bunch of farmers and shopkeepers and lawyers and fishermen guided by an idea that was only half formed at the time took on the greatest empire the world had ever known to that point and they beat them. Now how miraculous is that? And you people today are guided by the same ideas the same constitution and the values that you inherited that formed that constitution and you have got an historic project on your hands. And I want you to see the historic implications of it because what you are doing today is starting a revolution that is going to alter the whole face of not only your country but the world. And I don't want to lay a big heavy responsibility trip on you guys because there are people all over the world rooting for you, and we will step up to help you, but you're in the front line. So please, this is historic. I'm telling you that in 200 years' time, there'll be history classes in high schools in this country, and there'll be kids standing up, and they will have done some research and some genealogy, and they'll get up proudly in front of their classmates, and they'll say, I found out that my great, 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 great grandma and granddad, they were in the Tea Party. You know, our freedoms today are here. We enjoy our freedoms because of what they did back then. They saved this country in its hour of need. They stood up and stepped up. They didn't worry about their social standing or who was going to laugh at them or whatever. They did what had to be done and they turned this country around. So please, Keep that historical perspective in mind and whatever you do, keep the faith and keep working because I know if you do, you will win. So I want to say <clears throat> I'm here today because of what you guys are doing. And I just want to say thank you very much for what you're doing. Keep the faith, keep doing it, and God bless America. Thank you. Well, thank you for your bravery and your commitment, guys, because it's not easy. And um, I wouldn't be bothering doing what I'm doing if it wasn't for you guys doing what you're doing. Yes, please.
So I, I'm happy to take questions. Did you want to say something, Mary? Okay. I'll do that, then there's more questions to follow. Um, my government is unicameral, means that we've got one House of Parliament, so that if you gain the majority, you can pass almost anything you like. Now, we don't have a First Amendment, we don't have a Second Amendment, we don't have a Constitution. We have some conventions, and we have a small country where everyone knows each other, so the full force of tyranny is kept at bay. But there's nothing to stop a tyrant turning our country in, into a dictatorship overnight. We started in socialism way back. In the 1890s, William Pemba Reeves was our Prime Minister, and he introduced our first social welfare. He was a card-carrying member of the British Fabian Socialist Society. So you can sort of understand why my country is three notches to the left of your country politically. You know, our Conservatives would happily work within your, the Liberal wing of your Democrat Party, and our Liberals are basically Communists. So, um, but we, you know, I grew up in a society where we had free milk in the schools, free dental care till you're 18, free medical care for life, and I thought that was right and proper and natural. And that's where most Kiwis come from. You know, that entitlement mentality isn't quite as bad, well, no, it is as bad today. So even our conservatives think that's a natural way things are, the welfare state. Our government owns 60% of the land in the South Island. It owns a huge amount of our GNP. It used to own, we used to have taxes of 70 or 80% at one stage. It's a lot better now. So there have been some improvements. But just what I'm trying to say is that you guys have enjoyed a system and a constitution that has protected you. If you didn't have a First and Second Amendment, and that Second Amendment protects all the others, you would have lost your freedom decades ago. So you've got to guard that, because we don't have it, and we so envy, we so envy what you guys have got here, and we want you to restore your constitution so that we can have one of our own. So that's what we want to do. But in, yeah, question, sir. Has, has your research identified any connections or even alliances between the Democratic Socialists of America, the Communist Party USA, and Muslim Brotherhood front groups like CARE and ISNA and MSA? Uh, not so much directly that they, well, the Communist Party and DSA have a lot of influence in things like the National Lawyers Guild and the ACLU, and they support CARE and Hamas, etc. So the left supports these organisations all the time. The Workers' World Party is very, very close, which is a, a Stalinist North, pro-North Korean party, and that is very close to Hamas Kia. It's very close to Iran. They're always going to Iran. They, they work in Iran with the um, thing called the House of Latin America. So there's, a, there's an alliance between the Workers' World Party the Iranians and the Cubans and the Venezuelans. Okay, so they all work together. And they also, the Cubans and the Workers' World Party are also heavily involved in the Occupy movement, for instance. So there is many legs of this octopus, and the communists work very closely with the Islamics. There's no question of that. I'll take yours in a minute, sir, but yes, sir, down the back. and some of the other group, thank you. Um, how big, what exactly is the Fabian Society and how does it play a role in, in a lot of the, the drawing that you've done? Yeah, well look, the Fabian Society started in Britain in the 1880s and it, it took off there and it basically is a very, it's always worked within the British Labour Party. It's the, and it's served the same function the Communists do. It's moved the Labour Party to the left and is still very prominent today. Tony Blair was a Fabian. <clears throat> I think Gordon Brown is a Fabian. Most of these leaders have always been British Labour Party leaders have been Fabians. The US branch split off 
and formed something called the Intercollegiate Socialist Society and, so the, and, and several other organisations. So that they were involved in the RAND school and a lot of the social thought things of the time. That has descended right today to the Socialist Party USA and Democratic Socialists of America and they are all allied together in the Socialist International. It has also led, they, a split off of that formed the SDS in the 1960s, the student radicals, which then formed the Weather Underground. So there's a clear connection, you know, the clear lineage of, of Fabian socialism going right through this country. They're very, very strong in the United Auto Workers Union, for instance. They basically ran the, you know, Victor Reuter, Walter Reuter, they are all descended from that current. So, um, yeah, they are, the, they are the right wing of the left in this country. But uh, they're still pretty bad news, that's for sure. Trevor, could you tell us about George Soros and how is he connected with some of these activities? <clears throat> well, I'm going to give some opinion here. I usually try and stick to facts, but I'll speculate a little because the background is pretty murky. Soros is obviously the big money bags of the left in this country. He funds all sorts of Marxist groups, liberal groups, progressive groups. To me, in my view, the Institute for Policy Studies out of Washington, D.C., a far-left, Cuban-connected, Russian-connected institute, is the brains factory of the Obama administration. The Centre for American Progress, run by, um, oh, what's his name, Podesta, is the implementation wing that gets their policies into Congress. And I think, basically, Soros is the funder. He's the money bags of this operation. But I'd like to just look at Soros' history a little bit. George Soros was a little Jewish boy growing up in Hungary when the Nazis invaded. And his father, quite wisely, got him fostered out to a Christian family to protect him from the Nazis. Basically, hid him, hid his origins. But his <coughs> godfather or stepfather or whoever he was, was a capo. He used to take young George around confiscating property from the Nazi, from the Jewish population for the Nazis. And George Soros enjoyed the work. He thought it was very interesting. When the Nazis were kicked out by the Soviets who invaded Hungary, Nazi collaborators were hung from lampposts or sent to Siberia. They were punished. Soviets hated them, and so did the local population. Yet George, little George Soros was allowed to leave Hungary and travel through Soviet checkpoints and Soviet-occupied in in Soviet Austria. He was allowed to travel all that way through, unmolested, where he went to, the, to Britain, set himself up in the Fabian Socialist London School of Economics, and then started his business career. Now, I would say... In my opinion, it would be very difficult to get out of Hungary, let alone do what he did, unless you'd made some sort of deal with the authorities. I'd find it very hard to believe that he could have achieved what he did. Ever since he got to the West, he has worked against the interests of the West, against the interests of your country specifically, and very much in the interests of Russia and China. In the 1920s, there was a famous man called Armand Hammer. He kept going for a long time. He was a friend of Lenin. He was the son of the founder of the US Communist Party, Julius Hammer, a famous illegal, famous illegal abortionist. And Armand Hammer was a famous, was a businessman. He set up Occidental Petroleum and he did deals for the Russians. He got a lot of financing for the Russians, did a lot of trade. He helped keep that country afloat when it was under a lot of pressure. He later befriended, he was a very good friend of a guy called Albert Gore, a senator from Tennessee. You might know his son. Sort of had something to do with global warming and that kind of thing. So my opinion is, you know, Armand Hammer was a key Soviet agent. And I think that when America starts getting serious about internal security again, when you start holding Senate inquiries into subversive radicals and congressional inquiries, I think George Soros should be hauled before such a panel and inquired 
and it should be tried to, they should try and establish whether George Soros may be the modern Armand Hammer. That's my view of George Soros. Yes, sir. Okay, along that uh, line of what you just said, if we ever get back to investigative hearings by the Senate. We, when we do, we have to. It has to happen. I agree. So uh, we look at what's going on. I, I know I've heard about a, a quarter of what you've spoke about here tonight before. Is the, the, we, we have a term for people in this country called rhinos. They're Republican in name only. Are they just incompetent? Are they feckless? Are they in collusion? What, what seems to be the reason for them to be so spineless in holding this in check or to, to keeping it uh, from, from metastasizing as it has? Okay, it's a very good question, and I think there's, there's several aspects to that. In the 40s and 50s, the communists used to infiltrate the Republicans almost as readily as they did the Democrats, probably more, especially black communists, because it was a the party of Lincoln. Um, I think even Frank Marshall Davis was a Republican for a short time. So there was that element, the so and there was the so-called Rockefeller Republicans, the internationalist Republicans, there were the progressive Republicans, the leftist Republicans. They have been marginalised, and you know there's not so many of them these days, but you still got the old establishment there, the, the country club Republicans. But one guy I would point out who's being primary right now that I think is an example of the old leftist, very dangerous Republican is Dick Lugar out of Indiana, Senator Dick. Now, he is the man, he, he has agitated for a long time for normalization of relations with Cuba, a long time communist program, a former Rhodes Scholar, which is a, almost a guaranteed leftist bent. Um, he is also the man, the Republican, who got the Republicans to cross over the floor and accept, sign off the Strategic Arms Limitation Treaty, which Obama signed with the Russians not long ago. That was a key policy of the Communist Party USA. They've been agitating for that for, for years. And Dick Lugar is a man who got it signed off. If he hadn't got those Republicans to cross over, the Democrats didn't have the numbers. And that has given huge advantage to the Russians and huge detriment to your country. But I'll go into a little bit of Dick Lugar. He's got an interesting connection. In 1962, a guy called Leo Szilard set up the Council for a Livable World in this country. It was a peace pack, political action committee. And its job was to fund pro-peace, which means basically anti-US military candidates. Now, Leo Szilard was a Hungarian communist who became, was a key atom bomb scientist and a key security risk. The security people were on his case all the time. And he's been accused by a Soviet defector since of being a Soviet agent all through that time. Now he set up this political action committee. Today it is run by John Bonnier, a former US congressman out of Michigan, since number three in the US Congress on the Democrat side. Since leaving Congress, he's become an open member of the Marxist Democratic Socialists of America. So he runs that PAC now. And that PAC has funded hundreds of Democrats into office in this country. Hillary Clinton, Barack Obama, Joe Biden, Barbara Boxer, Wyden out of Oregon, Merkley out of Oregon, just about anyone you could name, all the leftists, they funded them. And one of the very, in the early 60s, they used to fund a few progressive Republicans as well. But in the last 20 years, the only Republican they have funded is dear old Dick Lugar. So Dick Lugar, who got your country to sign off a treaty that basically helped Russia, was funded in his career by a PAC set up by a Soviet spy. So that is why there is, to my opinion, there is elements in the Republican Party that need to be gotten rid of real quick. And Dick Lugar seriously looks like he could lose his seat this time. And if he does, you will never hear anybody cheer louder than me. We need to take a small break because this is being taped.